Tonight, eight new cases of COVID-19 have been recorded in Jamaica in the last 24 hours, taking the total number of infected persons to 715. As we continue to analyze the Mello TV poll, host Nicole Hales will be joined by political commentator Linton Gordon and Director of Health Promotion and Education in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Tekis Foga. Still tonight, Minister of Local Government and Community Development warns that all beaches and rivers in breach of COVID-19 safety protocols will be closed with immediate effect. And a four-year-old girl was killed and three NSWMA workers were injured after being hit by a runaway car in St. James. Good evening. As we continue to analyze the findings from our recent poll conducted by Bill Johnson, we will look at how concerned Jamaicans are about the COVID-19 pandemic and the ways that they are practicing social distancing and the wearing of masks. Host Nicole Hales will also be joined by political commentator Linton Gordon and Director of Health and Promotion in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Tekis Foga. Our team took to the streets for the views of the general public. They had this to say. Yes, I always try to practice social distancing in regards to the pandemic, that pandemic state that we are in. And as stated by the government, we should always try to wear a mask so we can lower the risk of spreading or catching COVID-19. And I always try to remember to carry my mask whenever and wherever I am going. No, I'm not worried. Um, I'm trying to change that mind frame so I no longer worry. Trusting that the government is making the right choices for us and also my personal hygiene is on point. Get, <laughs> and so I'm encouraging time. everyone to take personal hygiene into consideration. I always practice social distance because that can reduce the risk of catching the COVID-19. I try very hard. It's very important that we do, do these protocols because if you notice right now, there's a spike happening worldwide in cities that thought they had conquered it. I mean, even last night I heard the President of the United States in, now conceding that people must wear a mask. It's very important. The Ministry of Health and Wellness has announced that there have been eight additional cases of COVID-19 in the last 24 hours, taking the total number of infected persons on the island to 715. Stay tuned to Mellow TV Evening News at 8 as we continue to bring you the latest COVID-19 news. Continuing with the news, starting today, all beaches and rivers in breach of safety protocols established to curtail the local spread of the coronavirus COVID-19 will be closed with immediate effect. This warning comes from the Minister of Local Government and Community Development, Minister Desmond McKenzie, who says that non-compliant beach and river operators, as well as patrons, could possibly face prosecution under the Disaster Risk Management Act. Under the Act, persons in violation of the safety protocols can be fined up to $1 million or spend 12 months in prison. Minister McKenzie expressed that the decision to shut down beaches and rivers in violation of safety protocols has been taken in response to the high rate of non-compliance that has been observed at these facilities. He outlined that over the weekend, 63 beaches and 74 rivers were visited where it was observed that 67% were not in compliance with the rules. Meanwhile, Minister McKenzie announced that all cinemas and theatres will be reopened to the general public, effective this Sunday for an initial period of 14 days. Also, dining in restaurants will be allowed, but with no more than 50% capacity. In news from Trelawney, the police there have released a composite sketch of the suspect in the June 19 murder of 36-year-old Tamara Geddes, who was fatally shot in Reserve District in the parish. Reports from the Falmouth Police coming into our news center are that at about 8.30 p.m., 
Ms. Geddes was in her bedroom with her daughter when an armed man entered her house and shot her several times after demands for money were not met. Her daughter was not harmed. The suspect is being asked to turn himself in to the Falmouth Criminal Investigation Branch, CIB, or any police station immediately. In the meantime, the police are asking anyone with information on his whereabouts to contact the Falmouth CIB at 876-954-3073, Crime Stop at 311, Police 119 Emergency, or the nearest police stations. Citizens are being reminded that it is a criminal offense to harbor or create a safe haven for criminals. In news from St. James, four-year-old Shanika McDonald of Union Street Flanker was killed and three women were injured following a motor vehicle accident on Queens Drive Main Road in the parish yesterday. Reports coming into our news center tonight are that about 1.30 p.m., the driver of a blue Kia motor car allegedly lost control of the vehicle and collided with a Nissan AD Expert motor vehicle before hitting Shanika and the other injured persons who were standing along the roadway. Shanika and the woman were taken to the Cornwall Regional Hospital where she was pronounced dead and the three women admitted in serious but stable condition. The driver was also treated in hospital. The St. James Police are investigating the incident. In news from St. Catherine, a 24-year-old bus driver is now dead and a police officer is nursing chop wounds following an altercation between them in the parish yesterday afternoon. One of the police officer's hands was partially severed during the conflict. The deceased bus driver has since been identified as Alex Needham of Eltham Park, Spanish Town. Reports coming into our news center tonight are that Needham was loading a Toyota coaster bus illegally along Burke Road when the uniformed police officer approached him and instructed him to move to the designated area. A dispute developed, during which the bus driver reached for a machete and chopped the officer, who managed to pull his service pistol, shooting the attacker. Both injured men were taken to the Spanish Town Hospital, where the driver was pronounced dead and the officer admitted in serious condition. In other news tonight, the private sector organization of Jamaica, PSOJ, has welcomed the long-anticipated report on the Petrojam investigations and expects a speedy review of the reports by the Parliament's Oversight Committee. In a statement today, PSOJ expressed that while the organization recognizes the efforts of the political directorate in developing an institutional government's framework to include the Integrity Commission and major organized crime and anti-corruption agencies, these latest reports appear to justify the perception of most Jamaicans that for far too long corruption has loomed within our country. PSOJ's president, Keith Duncan, in commenting on the matter said, and I quote, the overhang of real and or perceived corrupt practices since independence has left many Jamaicans skeptical with a high level of mistrust in our leaders across the political, private and public sectors and civil society, end quote. The PSOJ believes that it is now full time for us all as leaders and citizens to raise the bar of accountability for ourselves and our leaders if we truly want to create a prosperous, fair and equitable Jamaica. And those were the stories making news. I am Shelly Ann Hill. We'll now join Nicole Hales with Decision 2020. Good evening and thank you for joining us for this evening's discussion. I'm your host, Nicole Hales. On March 10, the Ministry of Health and Wellness confirmed the first case of COVID-19 in Jamaica, a female patient who arrived from the United Kingdom on March 4. As the numbers climbed, the government implemented numerous safety protocols under the Risk Management Act in an effort to slow the spread of the virus. Two such protocols are the wearing of masks and the practice of social distancing. Tonight, we'll continue to examine and explain the findings from our poll conducted by pollster Bill Johnson. 
Also joining the discussion is political commentator Linton Gordon and Director of Health Promotion and Education in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Takis Foga. Lady and gentlemen, good evening and thank you for joining me. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me. Good evening, everyone. What, Good evening. It, what the public is asked, how worried they are about the COVID-19 pandemic in Jamaica, a little over 50% said they are really not worried. Mr. Johnson, give us a more detailed breakdown of the exact numbers based on the findings. Uh, certainly, uh, 40, a total of 45% said they were either very worried or somewhat worried. That was 20% who said very worried, 25% somewhat worried. But we found very significant differences between men and women. 51% of women said they were worried compared to 40% of the men. But there were also very, very significant differences by age. Uh, uh, those 18 to 24, the so-called Z generation, 38% said they were worried. And that slowly goes up to age 65 and older where 57% said they were worried. Now, the good news is that there were no differences politically based on past vote in terms of how worried people were. Uh, but as I say, it does vary by gender and by age significantly. Let's delve a bit more into the differences in the responses based on gender. Um, what were some of the responses that the female gave as opposed to the ones that men gave? Well, as I mentioned, 51% of the women said they were worried. 48% uh, of the women said they were not worried. And compared to the men, 40% of the men said they were worried. And 59% of the men said they were not worried. So there is a definite statistical difference there in terms of worriness. Okay, so with the different age groups, um, you will find that they would respond differently. What are those numbers showing based on the age cohort? Uh, yes, as I mentioned, uh, those 18 to 24, 38% said they were worried, and it goes up, uh, very slowly goes up till you reach 65 and older, when 57% said they were worried. So it goes from 38 to 57%. Uh, from 18 to 65 and above. Ms. Foga, you're hearing the numbers based on the age cohort. What's the Ministry of Health and Wellness's response to this? Well, we have been seeking to educate and to empower in various ways as we do different posts and we thank um, certainly your post are there for sharing that information because the more information we get it helps to guide our interventions so we have been trying to we have been more seeing persons well anecdotally seemingly not so worried anymore that is certainly the impression that is given when we you know go about doing our different interventions so it's interesting to get um that information but what it will do is to help us to be a little bit more targeted in messages that we send forth still on the issue of age those persons 65 years and over are still have limited um, movement um what there have been um issues of you know some pushback some pushback from that age cohort because they're saying the number of days that and the hours that they're given to conduct their business isn't enough. What's the Ministry of Health um, approach as it pertains to this age cohort? All right, so, well, first I should make the, the difference, a differentiation because we have our Ministry of Health's emergency operation that advises, recommends, but is ultimately guided to by our national emergency operations and for the you know, for the entire Jamaica led by the, the Prime Minister. And so there are measures that that is put in place at that level that speaks to the issues and, and concerns that are raised from our perspective on a parish level community intervention. We continue to collaborate with organizations that we know work 
closely with, with our senior citizens, like the National Council of uh, Senior Citizens. And the aim is really to, again, to empower, to help them to understand the reasons why we would want to um, have them stay in a little, the fact that they are at risk and at the same time try to get through the association some of the concerns that that together with other ministries we can help in any way so where there are issues that you know there may be um challenges in coming out and getting certain things i do know that together with some service organizations or assistance somewhere help is 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 given where it can and again through the national council senior citizens association um but you know, readily, the, the the measures that have been taken to keep them in has really been because, you know, we know the risk that are involved, the, the, the fact that they are susceptible to complications, if especially those with underlying illnesses, which quite a high percentage of that age group does have. So we continue to emphasize it, but we do work with other organizations to try to address other concerns that may arise. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Foga. Mr. Gordon, I want to bring you in right here. Um, the, okay. Based on Mr. Johnson's findings, a high percentage were women who uh, expressed um, fear of the COVID-19 virus. A high amount of our households are headed by women. From a social perspective, how do you see COVID-19 um, affecting the family, the family? Well, I am not surprised at the findings of Mr. Johnson because uh, women are inclined to be more cautious, less adventurous, and more careful. Secondly, the, there is a feeling going around in Jamaica that the consumption of alcohol is somehow assisting in keeping away uh, the infection, which is not so, but I think that there's that feeling and men have been gathering, consuming liquor with the hope and expectation that it will help. It will help. I don't think it will. But I think we need to look generally at what has happened since March. When the COVID-19 landed in Jamaica. There was widespread fear. By the time we got to April, some businesses were closed, fully closed. Several persons were laid off because there was a lack of understanding and widespread fear as to how easily you could come you could become infected and how widespread the, 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 the disease was throughout Jamaica. I think we have come over those hurdles to a significant extent. extent. There's a bit better understanding of the disease and the rate of recovery is fairly high. The rate of mortality is very low and put those two together there is a lesser fear in the society today of the disease as it was before and i think that the gap between the lower per the lower age group feeling safer or less threatened than those advancing age as bill and i are is not surprising because of the increased information and better understanding and improvement in treatment of persons who are affected. Thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. Now, limiting face-to-face -face contact with others is said to be the best way to reduce the spread of the coronavirus. To practice social or physical distancing, one should stay at least six feet or about two arms length away from other people. Mr. Johnson, what are persons saying regarding the practice of social distancing? Okay, basically 45% say they always practice social distancing 
50% say they sometimes practice it, and 5% say they don't practice it. Now, there are very, very significant differences here. Uh, if you go by region, in the Kingston, St. Andrew area, 54% say they always practice it. Fort Moore, uh, Spanish Town, 61%. Uh, Mo Bay, 48% and the rest of the country 37 percent uh in terms of men and women uh once again there's a gender difference 48 percent of women practice it say they always practice it 42 percent of men say they always practice it and we have our age difference again those under thir under 35 40 percent say they always practice it and that rises up until uh, 65 and older, or 63 percent say they always practice it. But I think one of the things that, if nothing else, came out of the survey is that there seems to be a potential for some problems in the Mo Bay area, just given the relatively lower uh, percentage of people always practicing social distancing. So we went on the streets to get the views of Jamaicans about the practice of social distancing. This is what they had to say. It was the, the panic and everything in the beginning had everybody really worried, but no. I guess it's died down and indications from like the airports opening and everything. I guess people know how to handle it better now because we know what to do and the signs and everything. So yeah, not really worried anymore. Still worried, but not very worried. We used to be very concerned, very worried about the whole pandemic thing. And after listening to the news, hear the Prime Minister talk over and over, we realized that um, there's no cure for it. And we have to just live with it like a normal life. So we still have a protocol so the same way, hand sanitizer, face masks. I'm not worried. I'm not worried about my soul. I don't worry about these things because the Bible speaks about these things. So I'm not worried. I'm not really worried, you know. I wouldn't say I'm worried, but a bit of concerns about how we go forward from here when this is all over. Nobody knows when it's going to be over. But I wouldn't say I'm worried because I follow the protocols, I follow the Ministry of Health, and I do the necessary things, sanitization and anything. And I really don't go on this, the road unless I have something to do, which is the necessary food items and stuff like that. I'm not worried. I think I think them doing a good job um, in terms of um, controlling it. The, the only concern we have is that the, the, the citizens have to understand how serious it is and um and respect what the minister of health is instruction that they give us. Follow them and then everything will be good. Miss Fogel, what's the importance of practicing social distancing and how does this help to reduce the spread of coronavirus? Okay, so the spread of coronavirus is uh, through the droplets that come from talking, laughter, um, coughing, sneezing of a person that is infected. And even if we watch ourselves when we speak, there are times when we see, you know, spit that will come out and there are droplets in those, you know, and so, and it goes a distance. So out of an abundance of caution, we, the, the, the amount of space that was given was six feet. I believe you, you will have differences in how far persons think, but generally it would be said to be between three feet to six feet is a possibility with six feet really being more out of caution. And so the distancing comes about from the fact that it's not just about um, being distant from somebody who is coughing or sneezing, but because a person can be asymptomatic, I can have it here and not know, and you know, seem perfectly fine. So the, the idea right now is that we try to contain, prevent spread by keeping that distance so that even if someone were to have it, and, and spoke and stuff, it would not have. But at the same time, when you asked me about distance and I was going on to speak to mass, but I'll wait till you reach the mass question. But this is the essence of why we should really keep our distance. 
Ms. Fogger, as a technocrat within the Ministry of Health and Wellness, um, you would have heard the responses based on the Vox Pop. How would you assess um, the Ministry's efforts so far in ensuring that the public adheres to the general social distancing practices? Wow. I would say that we have certainly tried in many ways to speak to it, whether through releases, through ads, and we actually have more ads coming up that speak specifically to the physical distance. So sorry about that. Mr. Gordon, um, we now have 707 cases of COVID-19 here in Jamaica. 192 of them are reported as imported. Um, the United States, they're reporting over 125,000 deaths. And in the state of Florida, over 10,000 new cases have been reported in a single day. With Jamaica reopening its borders to foreigners on June 15, how satisfied are you with the safety protocols that the government has been implemented so far? I think it is highly risky. The European Union has taken a position that they will not be allowing Americans from certain states to visit them because of the level of infection in those states. We are likely to have a significant number of tourists coming in from Florida. Whatever we put in place may mitigate, but I don't think it will ensure that there's not an increase in the level of infection being imported by having those visitors here. Secondly, the onus being placed on hotels to ensure that visitors stay in certain areas and don't go to other areas. It's not going to work. There's no system of enforcement in any hotel and there's no system of preventing a guest from going out. What do you do if a guest is leaving the hotel? Are you going to detain the person? I don't think there is any such power and I don't think we are going to be able to manage these visitors as we ought to. And it might be better to look at the option of being very selective in the persons we allow to visit as tourists during this time. To wear or not to wear a mask? That's the question many are asking when it comes to face masks in public places. Those against them say they irritate their skin and make breathing difficult. Others say it's an important way to help reduce the coronavirus. Based on your findings, Mr. Johnson, are the people of Jamaica willing to always wear a mask or they will wear sometimes or not, not at all? Okay, well, basically 36% say they always wear a mask. 56% say they sometimes wear one. 7% say they just don't wear them just don't wear them at all. And 1% don't know. Now, once again, there are very significant differences by region. Uh, in the uh, Kingston, St. Andrew area, 48% say they always wear a mask. In the Port Morris, uh, Spanish Town area, 41% say they always wear a mask. However, in Mo Bay, this number drops to 31%, and for the rest of the island, it also drops to 31%. Once again, there are significant differences between men and women. 40% of the women say they always wear a mask. 32% of the men say they always wear a mask. Uh, no. Of course, we also have an age difference here. 28% of those 18 to 24 say they always wear a mask, and that increases up to uh, age 65 and older, where 58% say they always wear a mask. I should add that these numbers uh, are significantly better than numbers in the United States and a lot of other countries, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Okay, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, before we wrap up today's discussion, uh, Ms. Foga, any final words? Oh, it seems we have lost Ms. Foga. We're trying to 
resume our connection with her. Mr. Gordon, your comments before we wrap up? Yes. Um, I'm pleased to hear that the numbers, though not at the level they should be, are fairly high, the number of persons wearing masks. We have to convince the rest of the population of the importance of this practice. I have observed in several businesses that it is enforced strictly and persons are turned back from the entrance where they are not so properly fitted with a mask. So I hope that we can increase and improve on this and we will rely on the Ministry of Health to educate the public more and ensure that it is widespread, accepted, and practiced by the vast majority, if not all of us. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. And that's it for our discussion for this evening, where we were looking at the wearing of masks and social distancing. We had with us this evening pollster Bill Johnson, as well as political commentator Linton Gordon, and we also had Director for Health Promotion and Education in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Takis Foga. That's our program for this evening. I'm Nicole Hales. Thanks for joining us. Tonight on Mellow TV Sports, Bonner and Blackwood impressed on the final Windies intra squad match. England will join West Indies in wearing the Black Lives Matter logo on their shirts. And new Premier League champions Liverpool thrashed by former champions Manchester City. We bowl off Mellow TV Sports with cricket as Jamaican middle order batsmen Jermaine Blackwood and Nkrumah Bonner both fell short of half centuries as the West Indies final intra squad warm up match ended in a draw at Old Trafford today. Bonner made a painstaking 47 from 114 balls, while Blackwood fell for 43 from 48 deliveries as Jason Holder's team batted a second time against Craig Brathwaite's team and were 171 for four at the end. Joshua De Silva continued to be in good nick, making an unbeaten 56 to add to his 133 not out in the first innings. Anderson Phillip took two wickets, including that of Hoda, with one each going to Roston Chase and Rakeem Cornwall. Earlier on, Kyle Mayers ended on 74 not out as Brathwaite's 11 were dismissed for 178 in reply to 272. Pace bowler Shannon Gabriel took 4 for 42 and Alzari Joseph 2 for 64. Head coach Phil Simmons has officially rejoined the team after his latest negative coronavirus test on the final day of the game. Simmons rejoined the camp having been self-isolating in his room at the team's on-site hotel at Emirates Old Trafford after leaving the bubble to attend his father-in-law's funeral. Before play, the West Indies marked the passing of the great Sir Everton Weeks, who died yesterday aged 95 with a minute's silence and wore black armbands when they took to the field under lights which remained on all day. Coach Phil Simmons says Sir Everton Weeks was a gentleman of the game. Another sad day for West Indies cricket. This time it's the loss of someone who you know, I personally consider to be a gentleman of the game and someone who has done so much for West Indies cricket, not just on the field but off the field. Someone who you could go to and talk to about cricket anytime. I think the West Indies has lost 
a gentleman yesterday in Sir Everton Weeks. England will join the West Indies in having a Black Lives Matter logo on their shirts for this month's tests. The England squad will, however, not take a knee before the first test at the Aggies Bowl next week. West Indies cricketer Carlos Brathwaite says sports people taking a knee is cosmetic and legislative change is needed to combat racial inequality. The gesture is a symbol of support for the Black Lives Matter movement. Brathwaite says athletes doing it showed the wider world that they are aware of what's happening in society. He, however, added that taking a knee in isolation or wearing a badge in isolation as well is not enough. It is the reprogramming and reconfiguring of the mindset, end quote. Footballers have taken a knee before matches since the resumption of the English Premier League season. Finally, speaking of the English Premier League, Liverpool's Premier title winning celebrations were slightly dampened as they were thrashed 4-0 by disposed champions Manchester City today. Now, Jurgen Klopp's side ended an agonizing 30-year wait for the top flight title when City lost at Chelsea last week, but were resoundingly hammered on their return to action at the Etihad Stadium. Elsewhere, Sheffield United picked up their first win since the Premier League restarted as they whipped Tottenham Hotspur 3-1 to keep alive their hopes of playing European football next season. Victory moves Sheffield United above their opponents into 7th, 5 points behind Manchester United and Wolves who are 5th and 6th respectively. Tottenham, who have not finished outside the top six since 2009, are ninth place, seven points adrift of Wolves. And those are the stories making sports news tonight. I'm Christopher Scott. Good evening.